All right, good <laughs> evening, everyone. I'm Noah Alba, I'm the program coordinator for the Jewish Community Library, which is a J program of Jewish Learning Works. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this evening's presentation on reflections of landscape and Hebrew poetry written by women with Elon Wittenberg. I want to thank the Friends of the Jewish Community Library for helping to make this program and so much of what we do possible. And I hope you'll consider supporting the library by becoming a friend. And you can do so at www.friendsofthejcl.org. Before we begin, automated closed captioning can be accessed by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen and selecting show subtitles. You can also turn subtitles off by clicking on the CC button and choosing hide subtitles. During the program, we'll all be muted by default except for Elon, but there will be opportunities for participation and you can request to participate either by raising your hand physically or using the hand raise function. And then you will be able to unmute yourself when it is your turn to speak. You can also type your comments or questions in the chat at any point. Elon, um, Wittenberg has been working in this community for many years and during his decades here, he has served as the director of the Dillertine Fellows Program, director of the Israel Education Initiative, and director of education support services at the Bureau of Jewish Education, which is our very own Jewish Learning Works. He's currently an independent educational consultant at the Ashman Family JCC in Palo Alto, and he lives in Oakland with his husband, Peter, and they together also perform um, as the puppetry puppetry duo. We're just so fortunate to have you as part of our library community, Elon. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's an honor and a pleasure to be part of this community and part of this larger community. I see some familiar faces here of uh, ex student of mine and um, Sahayafa. <laughs> and so it's it's um, I, I'm really honored to be invited again to uh, to talk and to talk about um, things that I really love and care about, such as poetry that is written in Hebrew. And this is actually part of a series that I started during COVID um, uh, on poetry in Hebrew. But the idea was to take songs. One of the wonderful things about culture that is being created in Israel is that many of the songs that have been composed and became popular songs were songs that originally were written not as songs to be, you know, sang, but as poetry by by poets and many of the composer where they were looking for high quality material went to different poets and and took uh poems and turned them into songs that people in israel know so it was very interesting for me to take those songs that we just sang and learned singing and and then look at the, at the actual poems and get into a little bit more into the depth of the poem and when I started to do this during COVID, I Jay discovered is an interesting, this is 15 minutes. <laughs> an interesting, albeit maybe knowing the reality we are living in, not very surprising thing that women who were written, who wrote poetry, were not treated with the same respect that men who wrote poetry got. And it, the more I looked into the poems that, that these women who are well-known poets in Israel, the more you understand the depth and the, uh, I think that the word profound is, is really not out of place, how amazing this poetry is and how, how unfortunate it is that it was not viewed, it was not deemed to be as important as, as, as men. So I wanted to do some justice uh, and look at several of the um, poets, women poets who wrote in Hebrew, specifically through the lens of how they, um, they used landscape uh, to maybe talk about things that are not landscape, about things that are, that are different. Um, so with your permission, Let's go on a kind of a journey together. Um, I, <laughs> Noah and I spoke uh, before and um, about the time of this, and um, I just did something similar at Limud Seattle, 
and it was two hours. And then Noah told me that this is one hour. So we'll see. <laughs> we, <laughs> because what I love is getting into the depth of the poem. So we'll see where we are. Okay, we have five poets. Maybe we'll just end up with one. But I'll try. I'll try to go deep, but also move on because those poets are different and they write in different times. And obviously, there are different people, so their poetry is. is is different. So let's go into that journey. And we're going to start um, that journey with a poet uh, named Rachel, who's a very well uh, known poet. Many people kind of when they uh, do trips to Israel, people go to visit Rachel's uh, grave at the Kinneret, and there's a big ethos. We'll talk a little bit about, about her biography. But um, What's more important for me than her biography is to look into her poetry. And we'll spend a little bit more time with Rachel, partly because she was one of the first ones, first women who wrote poetry in Israel. But also, I think the way that her poetry is viewed is kind of emblematic to the way that men look at, at women's poetry and, and kind of poo poo it. Um, so we'll spend a little bit more time with Rachel and then we'll we'll go and move to other poets like uh, Goldberg and uh, Yonah Volach and Dalia Arbikovich and Zelda, and if we get there. So in order to get there, let's go at any point. If folks have questions, if you want to ask or say something, uh, please uh, raise your Zoom hand and or write something in chat. And Noah promised me to let me know. And I'll stop from time to time and see, see what people wrote. I just want to remind folks when I'm in presentation mode, I don't see you and I can't hear you. So, um, so we'll stop from time to time. OK, let's go. Right. Good journey. Um, share sound, reflection, let's do this. Okay. So, when we'll start from the death of Rachel, and then we'll go back and we'll talk about her life and, and her poetry. But when, uh, when Rachel died, uh, this is the eulogy that this, uh, the national poet, um, Chaim Nachman Bialik, that's the eulogy that he, um, that he, you know, Carrie, that he spoke on, on, on her grave. She was well known when she when she died. She was very well known at the Yeshuv, at the um, Jewish community living in Eretz Israel. And uh, here is what he says. Our Hebrew literature and Hebrew poetry communities here in Eretz Israel have suffered a great loss with the passing of one of the members of the new chorus, the chorus of the Daughters of Miriam. The Jewish poetesses who gave in certain, in certain, that's me repeating, um, their melody into the chorus of the Hebrew poets and added new flavor to it. Now comes the, the small and humble flower bed of her poetry with her white flowers will blossom forever. Okay, and this is the national poet talking about a poet that in all honesty, I think he doesn't understand. And they, they, it's almost like better not say anything than say this. This, by the way, we'll talk about the different poets, but one of the common denominators, the kind of a thread, that they all started not from wanting to be poets, but wanting to be painters. Um, and Rachel is no exception. And this is a portrait of Chaim Nachman Bialik that Rachel, um, that Rachel painted. Not many people know that she, she really started as a... As a point. And here's something that kind of Blanche has said by Dr. Amalia Kana Carmon, who says to us, the poetry of women who write poetry in Hebrew is like the songs of bats in flight. It is done in a frequency which men cannot hear. Okay. And, and that kind of unfortunately for us, many of the critics who were kind of well known and pre and um, wrote in the papers critics about um, about poetry they were men. So they, um, the attitude towards, towards women was through the lens of, uh, of these men. And now, so let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, Rachel. You can see that she, she was really striking, uh, beautiful. So Rachel, Rachel is born in 1819 in what later became, I mean, you know, it was Russia. Her father was a very well-to-do um, um, merchant and her mom was very literate. There was a lot of artists coming into to the house. She grew us very um, well. Her mom unfortunately dies when she's 16. This is another common denominator with the uh, poetesses that uh, they all lost a parent, most of them a father actually. 
um, was for Rachel to lose her mom at 16 is, is older than the other poetesses that we will, um, we will talk about. But Rachel, when she is 19, she and her sister, they decide to go to Florence to study, of course, art because she wants to be a painter. The ship, they, they stop in different, in, in, uh, in Istanbul, they, they stop in different places and they stop in Eretz Israel. And they, she goes, she goes off uh, to, um, to, I'm going to stop this because I want to see you while I'm talking. So we'll go back to Rachel, but we're, <laughs> she, um, she goes to what uh, Rehovot, which later becomes a town, but but then it's a it's a small community, and there they rent an apartment. She plays the piano, so this is the only piano that that exists. In the they 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 have money, so they buy a piano and they play, and people come. and She starts to study Hebrew, and it's very interesting. How does she learn Hebrew? In two ways, she reads the Bible, and she speaks to children. And that's how she kind of starts. And when you look at her poetry, you see this mixture of very high uh, language with very simple, very approachable um, language. And while she is in Hobart, she hears a speaker by the name of Ada Gordon, who is really the messenger of what's called the religion of working the land in, in Israel. And I want to share some of the... Um, some of the things that um, Ada Gordon is right, because really is, you'll see the language, the language is the language of religion, but it's done in a, in a secular context, in, in uh, a secular humanist uh, culture. The soul should be examined in the light of other souls. So we're talking about the soul and light, right? We must enhance the light, not fight the darkness. And then the one on the left, talking about the religion of working. Right, You work here on the farm simply without philosophizing. Sometimes the work is hard and crowded with pettiness, but at times you feel a surge of cosmic exaltation, like the clear light of the heavens. And you too seem to be taking root in the soil, which you are now digging, to be nourished by the rays of the sun, to share life with the tiniest blade of grass. You almost can hear Walt Whitman, right? With, with each flower living in nature's depth, you seem then to rise and grow into the vast expanse of the universe. And Rachel, who was headed towards Florence to study art, she is now is being converted into the religion of working the land. And she goes and she joined this small group of people on the Kinneret, on the Sea of Galilee. And they're you know, talking and thinking, and she's beautiful, and, and everybody's into her, and she's like, really is into it. And of course, in order to be useful in this religion, you don't write poetry. What do you do? You work the land. So she was uh, herding uh, geese, but then she wanted to elevate her knowledge, and she is going to France to study agriculture, which is what people did in order to be useful. And then and she falls in love and she has this great love affair, which we won't get into, but um, then the First World War breaks and she's stuck right when she graduates. She is stuck. She goes back to her parents' uh, place in Russia and she starts working in an orphanage for refugees, for Jewish refugees, where she contracts tuberculosis. But what's really, and we'll get to the tuberculosis and that, but what's really important sometimes you know, when you when you look at statues and you see a statue and a, and a kind of the docent at the museum tell you, don't just look at the statue, look at the negative spaces in the statue. They also make a statue. What you, the, the spaces are divided differently. And I think that when we read biographies of people, we know that she works at the orphanage. But then my question is, what about the negative space? What did she do after she works at the orphanage? What do you do with all your free time? You don't binge on Netflix. So what do you do? She reads poetry and she starts translating and she starts embedding herself in the movement, in the stream of poetry of the day. And I'll give you two examples of uh, two movements of poetry that we know Rachel was um, influenced by because she translated it to Hebrew. So here is one. Okay. 
imagism, which is a, a more Anglo-American, um, it's a precision of, of um, clear imagery. Um, the great messenger of it in the West is Ezra Pound. He is anti-Semitic, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with him, but his influence, I mean, he writes beautiful poetry, <laughs> but um, there's, there's, uh, you can, there's a uh, kind of uh, this poem that he uh, calls on the Metro, the operation of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black box. That's the poem. And then there's a whole description of how he distills it and distills it and distills it to get to that. And he, of course, is influenced by um, Eastern uh, poetry. There's a, a poet, there's a Chinese poet by the name of Li Bang, was translated by Ezra Pound. Yeah. And we can see how he takes images, and we know from haikus, right, from other forms of, of, of Eastern poetry, how you take an image and an idea and you, tr you distill it. The jewel steps are already quite white with dew. It is so late that the dew soaks my gauze stockings, and I let down the crystal curtain and watch the moon through the clear autumn. I mean, the images are just so striking and so beautiful, and then you can get into it. But there's not a lot there, right? It's not a whole page. It's just a few lines. Okay, so we know that Rachel is influenced by that movement of the stealing of getting clear images and, and clearing them and, and clearing them. And then there's this other movement, which is called um, Akmeism. And there's a Russian poet by the name of Anna Akhmatova that, uh, that this is not Rachel's translation, obviously, because this is in English, but Rachel is translating her poem to, um, to Hebrew. And kind of um, Akmeism kind of has the same uh, idea of, um, of the stealing, uh, of taking images and kind of going to the essence, the center of, of it. So Rachel is influenced by this movement. The, the war ends. She goes back. Kinneret, the, the, that group that existed, does not exist anymore. But she goes to um, another uh, community, the Ganya, and she is joining the working people. But by that time, she contracted TB. And it's open. So she starts coughing and she starts coughing blood. And in a kibbutz like a kibbutz, there wasn't even a discussion. A member during the workday came in the middle of the day and said, you have to leave because you put in danger um, the community. And she, she has to leave. She goes. She, the, her sister lives in, in the land of Israel. So she tries to eventually she rents uh, an upstairs small apartment in Tel Aviv in Gordon Street, number five. And in her last five years, that's where she writes most of her poetry, in Tel Aviv. Uh, but she's very well known for her poems about the Sea of Galilee in the Kinnere. And one of the, ah, oh, and what happened to the, I think, the poem itself. So you see how much we're not going to talk about. I see the poem, the poem was somehow, um, here we are. It went all the way to the end of the presentation. But we got there. So now, um, and, and then, sorry, then she dies in 1927 from, from tuberculosis and uh, stuff like that. I, I, I'm afraid sometimes I hear of talking about Rachel's biography because so many people take her biography literally for her poems. And by doing that, they don't consider the images and what are the images doing. So we are not going to talk about her biography or maybe some. And we're going to talk about her poetry. With your permission, I'm going to read the Hebrew first because the translation I have are a crime, <laughs> horrible. I mean, you cannot, I mean, every translation of poetry is very challenging and you lose a lot, right? But, um, okay, so I'm going to read the, the Hebrew and then we'll talk about the, the poem in English. Sham hare golan poshet hayad vegabam bidmama botachat metzavim atzor בבדידות קורנת נם חרמון הסבא, וצינה נושבת בפסגת הצחור. שם, על חוף הים, יש דקל שפל צמרת. סטור שיער הדקל כתינוק שובב, שגלש למטה ובמי כנרת משכשך רגליו. מה ירבו פרחים בחורף על הקורה? דם הכלנית וכתם הקרקום? יש ימים פי שבע אז ירוק הירק, פי שבעים תכולה התכלת במרום. גם אם יברש ואהלך שכוח, והיה הלב למסורות זרים, האוכל לבגוד בך? האוכל לשכוח חסד נעורים? 
I don't know if you noticed, but even when I read that, you can hear her coughing, right? That third stanza, you can hear that as she writes that. But let's look now at the, at the poem um, on the left. I mean, I, I'm sure you kind of, may, I'm assuming you were reading the English as I was reading. So I'm not going to read the English. You can read it for yourself. But I'm going to point out several things right off the bat. We see that the two first answers start with the same letter. There was the same word, sorry. There and there, right? So we kind of see that the um, the poem is being divided. We have the first two stanza, then we have the third one, um, which we can see how many winter flowers. So we can see that all of a sudden it's like we talk about something, and then in the last one, though I, so we can see that all of a sudden she's talking about herself in the last one. So we see that the that the poem is already divided. Like we have the first part, which the two first stanza, then the third one kind of standing along and then the last one kind of concluding so let's look at the first and the second and compare them there sham the golan mountains reach and touch them with quiet assurance they say be still alone a light tapa hermon drowses and from the white peaks comes the chill for those of you who don't know the hermon is the highest peak in one side is in israel the other one is syria and lebanon but um but it's the highest peak in israel there's is snow there now and from the Sea of Galilee, you can see the snow, but that's not what we're talking about, right? Because we know that Rachel is not talking about the Hermon; she's talking about images that express something else. So, what does the Hermon symbolizes? What 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 are we looking at? So, first of all, we know that we're looking up, right? The Hermon is the tall mountain. We're looking up. Then we know that it's still that it's standing. It's like and and it. It's very pushing. Then we know that it, the, we, 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 it's old. Hasaba, in, in Hebrew, it's Hermon Hasaba, the grandfather Hermon, the grandfather mountain. Here is the, they say Papa Hermon, but in Hebrew, it's the grandfather Hermon. So it's tall, it's high, it's stationary, it's old, and it's cold. From the white peak comes the chill. So we have the all the high that we have that and then what happens in the second one there the shore a lowly palm okay like an impish boy with hair unkempt was trampled down to serious legs in lake kinere okay so for those of you who don't know lake kinere is the second lowest place in this planet the first one is the dead sea both of them in Eretz israel okay so we have the exact in the second one we have the exact opposite of the first one, okay? There the shore is low. So we have, instead of high, we have low. Grandfather, we have the unkept impish boy, the hair of the of the palm tree. What a, what a beautiful image, right? But the hair of the, and then we have the heat because they're going to to, to put their feet in the in the lake in there. Why would you do that? It's, it's hot, it's hot there. So we have something that symbolizes chill and cold and high and then the low. And then what happens in the third one? How many winter flowers on the Korak? What is the Korak? The Korak is a, is a hill, um, kind of not far away from Dganya. And all of a sudden, we don't get the high and the low. We get the something in the middle, right? We get the thing in the middle. And in that thing, there's... Um, Anemones, for those of you who don't, I just came back from Israel. Israel is flooded this time of year with anemones. It's just beautiful, beautiful flowers. Um, but look at the colors that she chooses, anemone of blood. And so she chooses the primary colors and the secondary colors, right? Anemone of blood, the red. And then, oh, of course, the red also kind of, we can hear the red as she's coughing the red, she's coughing the blood. And then there, the green is seven and then the blue, right? So she, so that place of in between, not of um, extremes, that place, the third is the place of in between, being that place between between that, what you might, might consider. I want to suggest, of course, it's up to interpretation and I don't think the uh, the role of is to to say, okay, that's what it is about. But I want to suggest that, that one thing is, is death 
and the other one is life, right? Or, or you know, the cold. And it, it, it can be many. I, I would love to hear other interpretations, right? But then you have the place in the middle, and then we come to the conclusion at the end. So I grow poor and walk about, and my heart is by strange and desolate. How could I betray you? And this first grade, could I forget? And the first grace of youth could be, you know, being part of the community. And also it could be a religious poem of, how, of, of, of that was my religion. I'm, I'm stuck in a, in a, a small apartment in, uh, uh, up in Tel Aviv, definitely not practicing my religion of working the land. Definitely not following the other Gordon, definitely not being, but what part of me, what part of that mercy is still in me? Okay, I'm going to stop to see if there's any comments or questions before yeah. we. Thank you, Ilan. Um, so we do have two, we have Shirley asks, um, isn't the word Shafel related to slime? Is what? The word I, I missed that. Sorry. Um, I don't remember what it refers to, but the word. Shirley, you wanna? Yeah, yeah. And the line where you're. Oh, sorry. I'm on two I different devices. Like... Can you please turn your radio off? <laughs> yeah. In the, I I, I will read. Hi, so I'm what? Sorry, did... No, why didn't you it. repeat? I went for some. Sorry. The where it says about the palm tree. And it has shun, yeah. uh, pe or fe lamet. Isn't that re uh, related to slime? That same word. Uh, um, like shafal. Shafal tzameret. Okay, shafal tzameret. Um, yeah, um, shafal can mean. Yeah, um, it's shafal in certain contexts could be like um, the Adam Shafel is like somebody who's like the lowest of the low that's kind of uh, okay. but I think I think this is where it's important to remember when she studied and how she studied Hebrew okay. um, yeah I, I think that un, unlike the other poetesses where Hebrew was even Leah Goldberg who was not born in Israel um, or Israel didn't exist then, but was not born speaking Hebrew or practicing Hebrew um, she, she her Hebrew was in her blood, not like Rachel. Rachel, some of the some of the language that she used, I think sometimes she uses it for how many of she use it for the sound. Uh, and I'm not and I'm but um but I think she does think low. What what words can I use that where the my view of the poem will go low as opposed to up to the thermon? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Another one. Are we moving and, on? And then, um, is this? Do we have two Shirley's? Um, Shirley Cohen says anemones sort of look like red tulips. So the, um, the it's really interesting because I, you know there's a whole other lecture about the posters that the Israeli government is issuing for Israel's Independence Day, and the um, the two that when Israel was two. Uh, the the poster is two on and I would say it right, wrong anemones or anemones and uh, those flowers and everyone in California thinks that they're poppies but they're not they're um, they're um, very common protected red flower in Israel and they have they have a, a story that goes with them about the nickname for the British mandate but that's a all different uh, other lecture so with your permission yeah. Are we um, any and, more questions? And one, yeah, one more. Um, Emily sure. Brewer asks, why would she speak of a man and a boy as self images rather than a woman and a girl for herself? Like, what does that mean that she decides to do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, he, in Hebrew, every object has um, every object has gender, unlike in English. So Har Hermon, the Hermon Mountain, is masculine in, in nature, but the, the, the Har is already masculine. So if she talks about the Hermon, she's taking those images, she's talking about the Hermon. And then the Dekel, the tree, the Dekel is also masculine. The tree is masculine by nature. So in, in English, tree could be masculine, feminine, whatever. In Hebrew, it's specifically masculine. Okay, Etz, tree is masculine, and Dekel, the palm tree is masculine. So I think when she chooses these images, 
and also I, I can't speak on her behalf, but she's also, um, you know, a product of her time. I mean, you know, we, I still in Hebrew force myself now, if there's, if I'm in a group with more women than, than men, I use the female pronoun to talk about us. But in, in Hebrew, I don't know if you know, if there's um, 10 uh, women and one man, you still say us as men. Uh, but, but that's uh, the Hebrew thing that well, it's a problem. We don't have, it, you have to decide is masculine, is feminine, everything. Now I'm, I'm, I'm drinking a glass of wine right now. The glass is feminine, the wine is masculine. What am I doing? Lechaim. Um, okay. Lechaim. Shall we get to Leah Goldberg? As we say, yalla, yalla, let's go to Leah Goldberg because Leah Goldberg is amazing. So Leah Goldberg comes after Rachel. She's, um, she is born in 1911 in you know, it was, it became um, Russia. When she's six, the family moves, they go to Lita and they being, it's right, you know, it's right around the uh, Russian revolution. They've been captured by the white, the um, the white army, her, her uh, they, they uh, accuse her father of being a spy and they arrest him. And for a week, they do mock execution of him. They don't kill him, but every day it's like they're going to kill him. And she's left by herself without, without her father. And nobody knows where the father is. He's coming back and he's suffering from post-trauma. And he's basically just loses it. He, he, he never becoming sane again. And the mother needs to raise um, Leah. She sends her to a school, but like a public school for poor kids. But most of the poor kids are Jewish. So she's the, one of the things that they learn is Hebrew. And she falls in love with Hebrew. And she starts keeping a diary in Hebrew at the age of nine. She writes um, in Hebrew. She keeps her diary. Amazing. I, I, I work in Jewish day schools here. And I, uh, Alevai, you know, that, that people would write Hebrew like that. And she, she writes. She keeps Hebrew. She falls in love with Hebrew. And um, she starts publishing already when she is, um, she starts publishing in Eretz Israel poem. They, published poems that she write. She get her doctorate at the age of 24. She get her doctorate for um, on Semitic languages. And she get her certificate that she gets from uh, Shlonsky, who's one of the leading poets in Israel. She gets a certificate to come and immigrate to Israel. And she does so in uh, 1936 when she's 25. And uh, she gets involved with the literary uh, community uh, in when she, when she becomes a well-known poet, and not just a poet, she writes. She um, she writes many children books. Our puppet, our upcoming puppet show this coming Thursday is her classic book that she wrote, "Room for Rent." You know, so she is well known as a children writer, as writer of poems, but all, always um, kind of being looked at as not as important. And one of the things that she is that are being said, she's not very important because her poetry is kind of women poetry, you know, simple, um, lovey dovey. Um, so let's look at her simple lovey dovey uh poem. Um, I'm debating if to tell you the context of this poem. Let's read the poem, this poem, and then let's talk about the context of the poem. So share screen again. Oh, you know what we didn't do? I told you that it's famous. What, what we didn't do is we didn't hear the song that Rachel wrote, Kinneret, which is one of the most uh, well-known songs. So we'll, 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 um, we'll hear a little bit of it. Oh, first, we'll have to go all the way back for all the things we might not have time to talk about today. And uh, here we are. So let's hear a little bit of it. <laughs> Oset hayad v'gaba Bidma ma botachat Metzavim Atzor Bivdidut korenet Nam kherman Hasaba Tepsina noshevet Mipisga Atzor Sham al chof hayam Yesh dekel shvar Samenet Stur se'ar hadekel Shegala 
unfortunately, without, but I'm assuming some of you, I, I see one block. I, Leah, it sounds like you know, <laughs> know the song. Yeah, I'm sure some of you know the song, but sometimes when you know songs so well, we don't take the time to really look at the poetry of the, of the song. Well, and now, with your permission, let's look at the other well-known. So Leah Goldberg also... Uh, she is also a painter, actually, towards the end of her life because of the criticism about her poetry. After she established the Department for Comparative Literature at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, um, she is still being looked at as not as, as important. Um, this is her. She was a heavy smoker. She died way too young for lung cancer. Um, and she, towards the end of her life, just just painted. She didn't, uh, she didn't write poetry anymore. And um, again, if, if I may, I mean, here really the Hebrew is so beautiful and the translation is, <laughs> um, so with your permission, I'm going to read the Hebrew and you can, you can read the English on, on your screen. Ha'umnam od yavo yamin b'slicha u'v'chesed v'telchi b'sadeh v'telchi bo kahele chatam u'machsof kaf raglech yelatef b'alei ha'aspeset או שלפי שיבולים את קירוך ותבטק דקירתם, או מטר ישיגך בעדת טיפותיו הדופקת על כתפייך, חזך, צווארך וראשך רענן, ותלכי בשדה הטוב, וירחב בך השקט כאור בשולי הענן, ונשמת את ריחו של התלם נשום ורגוע, וראית את השמש בראי השלולית הזהוב, ופשוטים הדברים וחיים, ומותר בם לנגוע, ומותר, ומותר לארוז. את תלכי בשדה, לבדך. לא נצרבת בלהט השרפות, בדרכים שסמרו מאימה ומדם. וביושר לבב שוב תהי ענווה ונכנעת, כאחד הדשאים, כאחד האדם. אוקיי. Okay. So let's look at few things here, and let's talk about when was this uh, poem written. So, האומנם עוד יבואו ימים בסליחה וחסד, how did they translate this beautiful poem? Is it true? Will there ever be days with forgiveness and mercy? So as Jews, when are days of forgiveness and mercy? We know it's during the Yom Kippur. It's the time of Yom Kippur, right? So we're getting into the time of reflection of Yom Kippur. And this poem is written in 1942. Okay? And in 1942, the Yeshuv, the Jewish community in Eretz Israel, especially, not especially, but, but, but we know that the artist community, and I, I, I think we, we're familiar with what happened after September 11th. How can you, how can you respond with, because the news start reaching and you start realizing what is happening in Europe. And those poets who are writing came from there. Their family is still there. And they get the news of what's happening. How do you respond through art? Can you respond through art? And there's big arguments among the writers. And some writers said, you have to stop. At times like this, you cannot do art. How can you do art at times like this? Even, even if you try to talk about what's happening, you cannot. Because words cannot describe what's happening. And others say, no, no, it's our mission. We are, we are now need to be kind of our mission is to to talk about, and at the same time, at the same year that, that Leah Goldberg is writing this poem, Avram Shlonsky, who brought her, writes a poem called Revenge, also in Yom Kippur. Lo lishkwa, like to, to, which is actually embedded in the uh, Kibbutz Haggadah that we have. It's the, the theme. And at that time, 1942, with her father, her, her father is still there. What is she writing? Is it true there will ever be days with forgiveness and mercy? She is writing about forgiveness. Yes. And how does she write? She's not avoiding the horror of the, um, the, the when you are stung by the raised broken stalks. Um, and then um, towards the last, the end of the poem, you will walk in the field by yourself, never scorched by the heat of the fires of the, on the past paved with horror and blood. She is walking, she is seeing this. And the rain comes 
And this is one of the things that people who don't speak Hebrew don't understand. The rain of Yom Kippur in Israel, it doesn't rain during the summer and it starts raining during the winter. In California, it used to be the same, but now it just never rains. But um, in, in, in Israel, there is a name for the first rain and for the last rain, a special name. And the, fir- and the name for the first rain during that time of Yom Kippur, it's called Hayore, the shooter, the thing that shoots at you. So when she's talking about the rain, it's not just any rain. It's the thing that shoots at you. And what does she do, what does she do with this on the downpour with the rain? Here it's simply rain, but, but if you know Hebrew, it's not just rain. Look at what happens with the rain. It falls on her shoulders, move to her breast, to her neck, and to through her hand. She sends it back. She takes the rain and she cleans herself. It's such an empowering movement. And then when she look at the cloud, yes, she, uh, the light that lines the cloud, the, the, the cloud is being seen through the, the, the light that lines it. So the sun is behind it. And the same thing, we see, we see that play that we also saw with Rachel, with looking up and looking down. And when you look down, you see up. Because when she looks at the puddle, um, I'm, I'm freely translating from the Hebrew, golden puddle, they said golden puddle. The golden puddle, the puddle is golden because she sees the sun. Up, right, so there's this movement that happened in the, the poem between up and down, and the freedom to go out. And she gives you the permission to go out, to get out of the whatever enclosed space of that community is locked in at that time. And then she says this most radical sentence. And in your heart, again, you will humbly surrender like one blade of grass, like one of humanity. And the word that she uses for humanity here in Hebrew is Adam, which is Adam, which is, which is the first story in Bereshit, in the book of Genesis, before the covenant with Abraham. This is universal. It also, in 1942, Leah Goldberg says, it also includes the Germans. There's also people. They're also Adam, which is unbelievable thing to say today about, about then. And a million times more at that time, right? How, regardless if you agree or don't agree, how brave it is to come and say something like that in the poem. And her poems are being poo pooed as, uh, Love, she's walking in the field, right? Okay, we'll we'll hear a little bit of it. <laughs> um, um, this beautiful, um, it was made into a beautiful poem, a uh, song. We'll hear a little bit and then we'll. because we don't have a lot of time, we are uh, stopping. And this is a, an opportunity for me to see or hear if there's any comments or questions. Oh, there's a lot of chat. Um, yeah, 
So Chava Alberstein actually sang both songs. And Chava Alberstein, for those of you who know her as a singer, she was very instrumental in going to poets and um, either looking into poetry books, going to composers, asking them to propose, or actually going to the poets themselves and asking uh, for permission. But many of the songs that we know of and are familiar are um, sang by, by Chava Alberstein. Um, so definitely both songs were written uh, um, um, so surely um, write about Hayore. Yes, uh, we're shooting. Yes, definitely. Uh, I can't. Oh, so I'm I'm missing. I, I want to know if there was any. Um, all of a sudden, I just see my I see myself. I want to see people. Here is gallery. Um, was there any? No. Was there any other um, questions? Because it kind of goes. Uh, um, we have Emily just commented in the chat. She said, it seems to me like the poem is expressing the movement of teshuva or returning. Of, of which one? The movement of what? Teshuva. Um, well, the, just Leah Goldberg was not, did not identify as a, as a religious person. I mean, she was, you know, that community was uh, strongly identified, Jewishly identified, but not, uh, not identified religiously as a thing. But of course, when we read a poem, the beauty of a poem is that the poet gives it to us to interpret in our own way. So it's all true. It's all good. It's the way it resonates uh, with us. And I don't think there's a true or not true. It's just biographically, she was she was not um, that we did not identify as a, as a religious person. Unlike so maybe maybe because of this comment, maybe we'll end um, maybe we'll end with Zelda because we don't have time. I told you it's two hours. We just got two out of five, but. Um, but let's 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 end with Zelda because because we talk about religious and Zelda is the um, it is very strongly identified as a as a religious woman um, and has a very unique um, unique story. So Zelda um, Zelda was born again in in Russia in 1911, um, 1914. Sorry, so just a few years after Lea Goldberg. But she, her first book of poetry, uh, unlike Leah Goldberg, who already started publishing when she was uh, in Lita, her Zelda's first book of poetry is published in 1967. So you do the math, she's 53. And, and she is coming from, she is the cousin of the Schneerson, the rabbi, Hasidic, the, you know, of the Schneerson rabbi. Her family moved to Jerusalem. Uh, when she is uh, about ten years old, and the year after they moved, both her grandfather and her father die, and she and her mom grow in pretty abject poverty, but very Hasidic. She wants to be, guess what, a painter. She wants to uh, to draw. She also lost her her parents, and she starts scribbling. On little piece of paper, these these poems that she doesn't, she's not involved really with uh, the world of art, the world of poetry, and we don't have the time to talk about Yona Volach, but one of the most surprising things in in the history of of women writing poetry in Hebrew is John, Yona Volach, who's you know I'll just show you a picture of Yona Volach, and um, you'll get that picture of this very kind of gender fluid, writing about sex without, I uh, think, Yona Volach. She is the one who convinced Zelda to start publishing. And they become very good friends until Yona Volach is writing this poem called Tefillin, about Tefillin as an s and uh, You'll see it in the picture. And then we'll look at Zelda's, um, at Zelda's poetry. By the way, if you read... Um, Amos Oz's uh, Tales of Love and Darkness. She was his Zelda was his teacher, and there's a whole chapter almost for uh, read it. It's it's fascinating because she was like uh, she was so embedded in the world of the Hasidim and and stuff, and everything was alive um, in Zelda's poetry. And so let's uh, we'll see um, we'll see that picture I was talking about Jonah Volach, and then uh, and then let's read Zelda and uh, maybe we'll. Continue. This is Dalia Rabikovic, which we didn't get to. And this is Yona Volach, okay? So that's her, and she's becoming best friends with Zelda, who's Hasidic, Jerusalem, uh, Zelda. And look at Zelda's poem. 
this is one that was made into, I mean, she has uh, Lechol Ish Yashem, which is the most famous poem, but but this one is less familiar, but I, I just love this. Um, and maybe we'll just, um, well, we'll read the Hebrew and then. Kol Shoshana Hii, Shel Hashalom HaMuvtach Hashalom HaNitzri. Bechol Shoshana Mitgoreret Sipor Sapirit Sheshma Vechitetu. Venidme Kokarov אור השושנה, כה קרוב ניחוחה, כה קרוב שקט העלים, כה קרוב אותו אי, כך סירה וחצה את ים האש. Okay. Um, so, for Zelda, who's coming from the, this deep world of, of, of Hasidic movement, everything has a soul. So imagine she's, she's walking and she's looking at a rose bush. And she is looking at a rose bush, and what does she see? She sees Noah's Ark. She sees the leaves are an ocean. And then every rose is an island. Every rose, not this rose, not that rose. Every rose is an island. Surrounded, and what's inside each one of the island? There is a sapphire bird, which is like it takes our images away because when we think of a of a boat that crosses the ocean, when we think, for example, of Noah's Ark and a bird, right? So all these images are there. The bird is the dove, but here um, the sapphire is not white. It's this, it's this essence of this gemstone that is clear. I don't know if I have it right here. It is it clear blue. So we we get those those images that are that are connected, but they're also not right. Like this this bird is not the dog. It's the sapphire. It's something that is gem. It's hard. It's it's condensed. It's clear, and that's the bird. And what's the bird's name? The bird's name is not Yonah. Listen to the Hebrew. the 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 word is not Yonah, which means a dog. No, it's Vechitetu. Just hear that sound. Vechitetu. There's there's something very. And what is vechitetu? Vechitetu comes from the Chazon Acharit Ayamim, from Isaiah, the end of the days, and they will turn. They shall beat their sword into plowshares. That's the vechitetu. They beat their sword into plowshares. She takes that. She takes that vision of peace. As I'm speaking, I'm, I'm realizing how appropriate it is to, to speak about this poem at this time, right? She's, she's talking about this essence of peace, but then she, so this, it's like every rose is an island, right? It's like she sent us on this journey and in the midst of the rose, there, there's these sapphire birds of peace, of this, this eternal vision of peace, and it seems so close, so near the light of that rose, so near the sand, the silence of its leaves, so near that island, take a boat and break through the sea of fire, which you can't really do, right? Or you can, but, right? I mean, it's, Again, it's so simple, right? What is she doing? She's talking about a rose. But what, how much does she pack into this? Okay. So. This is Zelda, right? I don't know if anyone has any comments or questions. I promised an hour, so kind of. We, we packed it. If not, maybe we can do one more. We have a few okay. minutes left and we can go a few minutes over. All right. So, um, yes, more, okay. <laughs> Boy, it's a big dilemma because uh, there's Dalia Bar 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 Rabikovich. Maybe we should do Dalia Rabikovich. Um, um, you know what? We can do more. I'll just, I'll just do, I'll just do very quick. Um, I'll just do very quick Yona Volach, very quick, very short poem by Yona Volach, and then we'll end with Dalia. Um, so, so I promise not to go to, um, away too much. But um, 
let's go back to um, to Yona Volach. And Yona Volach, Yo, so so the story of Yona Volach, she's she's born in in Kiryat Ono in 1944, and of course, um, and when she's four, uh, her father dies in the War of 48, and she also grows without a father. She um, she's really a, what what you would call a troubled child. She's she's uh, very aggressive until she is being sent to an art school when she's uh, seventeen to study um, painting, and she start she start writing. And then when she starts writing, she also um, start experimenting. She goes to Jerusalem and she interns herself on purpose in a mental institution where she kind of get in touch with a um, psychiatrist or Sado's who start um, um, experiencing with mind altering drugs. And she's taking a lot of drugs in that mental institution as a way to, of uh, treatment. But basically she comes out of it and her poetry, one of the things with her poetry is her poetry is super immediate. Somebody, somebody described her Hebrew as like she drank Hebrew through the faucet. So sometimes with, with Yona Volach, what you get is the impact, and this is, by the way, not the poem. <laughs> I'm realizing that this is not the poem that I was going to talk about, <laughs> because. Um, but I, but, but this short, very short poem, and I just want you to listen to the Hebrew. Okay, v'nakik nistar betzukim ayala shotamay mali vela ela tzukei libi ela mayan chayai ela nistar ayala mali vela ela avati. Do you hear the la la la? And the la 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 has different connotation because la la ila la is the opening of the Quran. There's no God but God. La means no. La means to her in Hebrew. La la la. And ayala is a doe. And she's, so she's taking the ayala and that image of the doe, but she's, she's playing with that sounds of the, of the Hebrew. And we don't have time to look into it, but you can tell. If if you were to start looking into femininity and 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 sexuality and where what's the door and what's someone like Yona Vola who's trying to project an image of a strong woman, of an, a woman who's like taking charge and wearing leather and being very SNM y and stuff like that, and then exploring within herself. What, what what between what, what for me and the dog but but as the, as the poem said everything right everything is is me and that that ayala that uh do. it's a beautiful beautiful song so i want you to re hear it a little bit it's a song that many people sing on shabbat now were um, were composed by different um, different artists and maybe um, to um, to end we will um, just look at um, look at uh, Dalia Rabikovich for a second 
Um, Dalia Obikovic, one of the most famous uh, women poet of, uh, of Israel. She was born in 1936. And um, how that, so, so the question is, well, how did her father die? Uh, her father died um, in, when she was six by um, a drunken um, British officer. It was during the British mandate of um, Israel. So uh, her father was run over by, by an officer. Nobody told Dalia Urbikovic that her father died. And for two years, she didn't know until one of the class uh, mate told her, I, you know, your father is dead. She, she, the people kept telling her, he'll come back, he'll bring presents he, um, and stuff like that. The mother, again, there was, she had... Um, two twin brothers who were six months old when her father died and the mother just didn't have any money. So they moved to Kibbutz Geva. I grew up on a kibbutz. Let me tell you, to be an outsider on a kibbutz as a kid is not a nice um, experience, especially if you write poetry. And uh, and apparently Dalia Rikovic was very, um, you know, she was dreamy. She 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 wrote poems and she was really uh, suffering. So at the age of twelve, she decided to take herself out of the kibbutz. She's moving herself to Haifa by herself, and she's moving between five foster different foster um, families. Eventually, she gets to again an art a specific school called Chugim in Haifa, where she starts writing poetry. Actually, this poem is when she was seventeen. Uh, we'll soon get into it very quickly, and then um, and then she publishes her first book of poetry when she's twenty three. It's being received beautifully, and um, Leah Goldberg is a big influence on her. And she spends a career uh, writing poetry, dealing with a lot of mental health issues until she's found dead in her apartment. People think it was suicide. Apparently, it was not. But um, this, let's look at uh, at this poem, and we're looking at a reflection of you, and it's it's uh, quite quite beautiful. Um, um, the sheepish green forest flow down the hills, and the sea below splash and turn blue from the sun. In the sky, clouds blossoms like water lily, and we were still girls. And one of us had beloved eyes, and we were all jealous until we forgot. And one of us was bright and stood tall. And they were asking her questions in class, and she knew how to reply. And I would go out to the sunny days, uh, on a sunny day, to the fields close by, and love the clouds and contemplate stories. And I had plenty of times to reflect upon sorrows from the start of autumn until the end of the yellow summer. Okay, so uh, so the Hebrew is Hokshota Kvasim the 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 green forest of the sheep. If you know Haifa, you know that um, the image that we are the image that we are getting is um, is this image, right? It's those pine trees going down. So so it's it's a very local image that she's describing, the image of Haifa. But what she does again is that play that we see in Rachel's poetry and in Leah Goldberg poetry when she kind of paints, she, she is also wanted to be a painter, by the way, of course, and she paints this painting and she describes initially that, that, that let's look at the play between up and down, right? So you have the, the hills are flowing down to the sea and what happened to the sea? It becomes blue, where from? From the sun, so it goes up and down and in the, in the, um, in the sky, clouds are blossoming like what like um, lilies? Okay, so you you can see that the gas painting, right? Like you can see that painting that she's referring to, except that his painting of the famous water lily are in the pond, and hers are up there, right? So she takes that world, and it's a it's a wholesome world. It's a world where up and down are reflecting each other, and the ages. She is a kid, so the world. It's not even there's even no separation between her as a that her and the other kids and the kids and nature everything is one everything is unified and then we get to the second stanza and 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 one of us had beloved eyes right so right away there's separation there's separation not just between people and nature because where are they they're in the classroom they're inside they're inside on chairs in the classroom. So there's separation between people and nature, but also there's separation between one and the other. And when she looks up, 
the it, the game, the play that she does in the poetry between being down and being up. What's that down? She's looking up at that girl who who's tall and knows how to answer. She has all the answer, right? So she's down here and that girl is up there and everybody's jealous. So there's this separation and there's also growth in terms of where she is in terms of her life, right? She's not a child anymore. She's now in the classroom. And then she's going out again. But this time, it's not nature and her. She's, it's her, totally separated from the community, in nature. And the last two lines, right? And I had plenty of time to reflect upon sorrow from the start of autumn until the end of the yellow summer. When is the end of the yellow summer? The start of autumn. So when she said from the start of autumn until the end of the yellow summer, she is basically creating a circle. And the circle is a circle of, of sorrow. Maybe that's not the right tone to end on the uh, on the thing, but but just just to um, just to conclude, none of the poems we looked at today were long. And some of them talked about girls in the classroom, and some of them talk about the doll, like a deer, a female deer. And some of them talk about the woman walking in the field. And some of them talk about roses. And, and one sometimes talked about the Kinera, the Sea of Galilee, and the Hermon. Right? So, so male critics who are looking, it's like, what are they writing about? It's not the liberation of the nation, and it's not the revenge, and it's not the time. But I want to say a few things. First of all, these poems are read today, even though some of them were written in the beginning of the century or in 1930 or 1940. We read them today and the language is still alive. It's a language that we, we can read. It doesn't, it's not archaic at all. It sounds like a language that a, that a person who writes poetry today will write in this language. So the language stay. And the other thing in, what short poems, how much they compact. Life and death, forgiveness, peace. They are talking about the, the national, but they're talking through very distilled images that like the bats in their flight, men cannot hear. And that was my concluding. Uh, Remark, and I don't know if anybody wants to say or we say 10 minutes after the time. Thank you so much, Ilan. This was really wonderful. You're welcome. Um, so, um, maybe um, we'll so stop the recording now, and because we have an intimate group, we can allow people to unmute and um, say thanks or goodbye or whatever. <laughs>